Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Steve. And so um, I'd like to get off uh, to an early start. You've all gotten up early, either here locally or streaming in. And uh, talk about what I enjoy talking about a lot is the food prescription approach to the treatment of cardiovascular disease. Now, even though you see cardiovascular disease listed there, you can actually remove cardiovascular disease and insert in the blank whatever chronic ailment that you want to insert. And so we're going to talk about a new paradigm shift that is needed. And what we're trying to do in Houston is trying to optimize and develop the prototype for that paradigm shift. Um, let's get my clicker working here. So as uh, Steve mentioned, uh, my day job consists of uh, working as an ordinary cardiologist. I'm a cardiologist, I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist. That means I specialize and subspecialize in heart rhythm disorders. And so individuals who are at risk for not only having a heart attack, but you may be at risk of dying suddenly or passing out or something like that, you may see a cardiac electrophysiologist. And uh, so my day job may consist of prescribing medications or doing coronary angiograms or, or implanting defibrillators or pacemakers or the like or admitting people to the CCU. But what I like to do in my day job or weekend job or after hours job is help people avoid the need for my day services. And that's where I do the work with Montgomery Heart and Wellness. I uh, go around the country speaking as I am now. And uh, we have a program in our facility that actually transition individuals who come in with the chronic ailments and 21 medications and many surgeries, and we halt those diseases and transition them to this different approach. And we'd like to talk to you about uh, the details of how we do that. Uh, in my talk, I'm going to go over the overview of some epidemiology of cardiovascular disease. We'll talk about some of the risk factors, the, some that are modifiable. Uh, we'll talk about some of the key lifestyle factors that contribute to heart disease. Uh, and I'm going to give you a little bit of insight on the state of our therapies. What do we do in the standard of care? I practice in the largest medical center in the world. And um, we have a lot to offer for someone with heart disease, but oftentimes it costs a lot. And we'll talk about that. But we'll talk about some of the historical things, some of the nutritional interventions that have been done by people that's come before me, some people that you know, Dr. Esselson. We'll talk about some of his work and Dr. Ornish's work. And uh, we'll give you some insight into the biochemistry and physiology of uh, heart disease and how nutrition biochemically positively affects heart disease. So there's science behind this, as you may have heard from other talks, in terms of how this works. So this isn't just willy-nilly stuff that we're doing. And uh, I'll give you some case presentation. I think it's always important uh, to bring home uh, the message by looking at individual patients that we've treated, and we'll look at some of the clinical data. So let's go a few housekeeping items here. Uh, I'm from Texas, and uh, I don't know if anybody else is from Texas, but y'all recognize this uh, thing here? What is this? Is any other? Pickup truck. <laughs> and so we drive this in Texas, and uh, we don't ride horses, as people often ask me. Do you have a horse? I don't have a horse. I've never ridden a horse. But uh, this is actually my pickup truck. And I like showing it off. It's, it was just washed before I took this picture. And here is the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the abdominal on this pickup truck. Y'all see that number? 299,999. And the next picture shows the milestone, 300,000. This pickup truck, and this was February of this year, February of 2015, actually. Uh, this pickup truck achieved the milestone of 300,000 miles. Now, why am I making such a big deal of that? Well, I've had this pickup truck from you know, the very beginning. I've taken care of the pickup truck. I enjoy it. Uh, and the reason I was able to get to 300,000 miles is actually at 319,000 miles now. But the reason I was able to get there is because I always put the best oil in the pickup truck. I always gave it the best fluid exchange. And so I gave it this fluid exchange on a regular basis, change out the gaskets and filters, et cetera, i.e., my pickup truck went through a nutritional detox on a regular basis. And it got the best nourishment, the best nutrients, and as a result of this, it's over 300,000 miles, still driving well. I pass up lots of vehicles that don't feed their, lots of individuals don't feed their vehicles well on the side of the road. Uh, so the engine is still going strong, 
And so very much like my pickup truck, your body requires the optimal nutrition to go the long run. And so we're going to talk about some of that down the road. But first of all, let's talk about the epidemiology of cardiovascular disease. You may have seen some of this data before. Uh, heart disease is the most common cause of death in the United States, about one in four deaths, about 600,000 people have died. Um, coronary disease kills, uh, contributes to this greatly, uh, 380,000 people annually. About 720,000 individuals uh, <clears throat> have a heart attack every year, and it costs us quite a bit. Almost $109, $110 billion a year is the price tag we pay for coronary heart disease. So why is this the case? If you look at this slide, and this slide tells a lot of things, you notice that the bar graphs on the left, and there are different age groups. At the far left, there's an age group of men and women, 20 to 34. Uh, and you go to the next bar graph, 35 to 44, 45 to 54, and so on to 75 plus. Notice how the bar graphs get higher. Uh, the blue bar graphs are for men, the red bar graphs are for women. And notice, in the younger ages, the blue bar graphs are taller than the red bar graphs. That means more women, excuse me, more men have heart disease in those younger ages than there are women. So the prevalence of heart disease in ages 20 to 34, 35 to 44 is higher in men than women. But something interesting happens once you get to the age of 45 to 50 and older. The red bar graphs catch up and pass the blue bar graphs, which shows that there's a higher prevalence of heart disease in women than men in these older ages. And in fact, now, probably since 2010, 2011, more women are dying from heart disease than men. Women, heart disease has become a woman's disease now. So that's one point. The other point, which is obvious, is that everybody, men and women, as we get older, the prevalence of heart disease increases, which implies that as aging is a, a natural progression of heart disease is, is with aging. So is that natural that we should just, the heart should just simply weaken and become more diseased as we get older? I don't think so. And we'll talk about possibly why that happens. But the third thing I'd like to point out with this slide is something that it doesn't show. If you look at the bar graph of the age group 20 to 34, and look at the blue bar graph that represents the prevalence of heart disease in men at that age group, and it shows, shows about 11% of men have heart disease in the age group of 20 to 34. But we know that that is misleading because there are autopsy studies that were done back in the mid-1950s where it looked at, they did autopsies of male soldiers who died in the Korean War. And they looked at their hearts, about 300 soldiers, and in autopsy studies, almost 80%, about 77% of those men had gross plaque in their arteries. This is on autopsy studies. Subsequent autopsy studies have shown the same thing or similar data. So if you take the bar graph, 24 to 22 to 34, and you compare it to that to the autopsy data of these soldiers, and by the way, the average age of these soldiers was 22, it actually shows that instead of being 11%, it's really up here. So the bar graph for men doesn't really start here in this age group. It starts here. Well, why is there a discrepancy? There's a discrepancy because Men at this age don't go see the doctors, don't get EKGs, don't get stress tests and the like, and the sensitivity of an EKG is less than 50%. So if you get an EKG and it's normal, you still may have coronary disease. So you're going to miss a lot of disease. Why they caught it in the autopsy study, because these individuals were killed for other reasons. Gunshot wounds, helicopter wounds, and so they went and looked in their hearts and saw that, wait a minute, these guys apparently didn't have symptoms, they were physically fit, they were athletic, they were soldiers, they were, many of them were, were thin, but despite that, they had gross plaque in the artery. So an autopsy is going to give you a sensitivity that an EKG or just a routine screening exam can't. So you're able to pick up here. Now, the problem is, if the prevalence in this age group of men, and likely women, is not here, but here, and you take my little arrow, and we know that as you get older, the prevalence gets higher. What if we started our arrow here and then shoot it up? Then what is the prevalence of heart disease in, say, 35, 40, 45, 50, et cetera? Virtually universal. So if you on the standard American diet, and I'll prove that point more later, but my opinion is if you on the standard American diet, 
and you age over 35 or even over 30, you very likely have heart disease, virtually 100%. I'll give it 99.9, .9, give you a chance. But the point is that the lifestyle gives you a 100% chance of having some form of heart disease. And many people have it. That's why it's the number one cause of death and morbidity. And there are many people who have heart disease who are asymptomatic. And so they're just walking around like time bombs. But what are some of the risk factors? Predisposing risk factors, we know of them. Hypertension is one, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, and obesity and being overweight, which actually ties into some of these others. Uh, about 31% of our population have hypertension. About a third have uh, hyperlipidemia with a total cholesterol greater than 200. If you uh, look at uh, subparticles, uh, that number is probably higher. Diabetes, nearly 10%. Um, that number could be higher because there are a lot of individuals with prediabetes who has insulin resistance. They may have a relatively low um, uh, uh, hemoglobin A1C but may still have prediabetes, obesity, and overweight, about 70% of the population. So these predisposing factors contribute to heart disease. If you look at hypertension, similar type progression over as with age, with hypertension, as you see with heart disease. The younger the group, the lower the incidence of hypertension, the older, the higher the prevalence. If you look at diabetes, the prevalence of diabetes in our population uh, from 1980 to 2010, it was almost an exponential growth in uh, the prevalence of diabetes. And so we're seeing these chronic illnesses grow and develop over time uh, that, again, these are the contributing factors to, to uh, heart disease. It's estimated by the CDC that from children born after the year 2000, about one in three will have diabetes before adulthood or by the time they're adults. And so, again, another major contributing factor to heart disease. How about behavioral uh, risk factors? Smoking, you know, there's a lot of uh, campaigning against smoking, and we've done a great job of, of reducing the incidence of smoking. Fewer than 20% of the population smoke now. Uh, how about excessive alcohol use? About 16%. But the problem with smoking and alcohol, I just gave you data suggesting that the prevalence of heart disease is almost universal, it's almost 100%. So can you really blame it on smoking with fewer than one in five people smoke, but a large percentage of people with heart disease? You really can't. Smoking in and of itself, by itself, is not enough of an explanation as to why we're having so much heart disease. Same thing with alcohol use, which is another major behavioral problem. But if we start to look at physical inactivity, you know, we are a sedentary uh, society. And so approximately 60% of the people are sedentary, and so that certainly could contribute to uh, coronary heart disease and other chronic illnesses. But how about poor dietary habits? Now this 80% estimate is probably an underestimate because it looks at poor dietary habits and the usual definition of poor dietary habits probably has a lot to do with people eating fried foods and, and the worst stuff that you can think of. Uh, but if you just include everybody who eats any form of animal protein on a regular basis, uh, that poor dietary habit percentage can go up, probably in the 90% range. So our behavioral factors certainly have an impact. But what about exercise? Can I just have my cheeseburger and run it off? I mean, that's a common uh, understanding. I mean, if I eat a little bad food every now and then, I'll just, you know, work out a little extra. Well, you may recognize a person in this picture. If you don't, his name is Jim Fix. Uh, Jim Fix was a well-known uh, runner and author of uh, the uh, Complete Book of Running. Uh, and at the age of 51, Jim died suddenly of a cardiac arrest. Uh, and you see Gene, Jim, he's lean and mean, an athletic machine. Uh, but he was found dead, and when they autopsied his heart, all three of his major arteries had about 90-plus percent uh, blockage, including the one that led to the uh, heart attack. So if you look at someone like this, does he look like someone with uh, heart disease? No. Uh, and people say, well, it's in his genes. But he doesn't wear jeans. He's a runner. <laughs> so we can't blame it on his genes. Uh, we have to look at something else. And it probably has a lot to do with what he's eating. So the other factors that the American soldiers I talked about earlier, 
in the 1950s. These are survivors of the Korean War, average age 22. About 78%, almost 78% had gross coronary plaque. These men were lean, physically fit, military men, but despite that, they had coronary disease. So you can't outrun bad food. You can't run it, if you put it in your mouth, you can't run it off. As I said last night in the panel, I'll talk to my patients, I said, look, if you put a drop of cyanide in your coffee, how far do you have to run to run it off? You know, it's a ridiculous question because it's the biochemistry of the cyanide that you're worried about, it's not the calories. And it shouldn't be the calories of the food that we're concerned about. I really don't care that, you know, a cheeseburger has lots of fat and lots of calories. We understand the fat and calories are a problem. But it's the biochemistry of the food, the biochemical reactions that it set off that really cause the problem. Because somebody's going to invent a low-fat, low-calorie cheeseburger that's just as toxic as the high-fat, high-fat calorie cheeseburger because it's not normal food. So we want to talk about that. It's the food.